Give it up for Richard. The man is a legend. So I'm Betsy. Um, I moved to Memphis about two years ago, and I got to say, you guys are so good at acting polite. <laughs> it's like I feel like I'm in Canada, but instead of tapping a tree and getting maple syrup, I get barbecue sauce. <laughs> I'm from Nebraska. Uh, when I moved here, I quickly found out that I have a Nebraska accent. Apparently, I sound like soybeans and resignation. <laughs> it's true. Basically, the subtext of any conversation you'll have with a Nebraskan is, <sighs> well, guess this is it. You guys have signs in your house to say, bless this house. Our signs say, all that work for nothing. <laughs> I grew up on a farm, surprise. And uh, most people think of farms as having a lot of animals. That wasn't true in our case. And so I had to learn the song a different way. It went, old MacDonald had some crops, E-I-E-I-O. And in the summer they would die, E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> And we're poor, poor, poor. Yes, we're poor, poor, poor. What were those farm subsidies for? <laughs> we did have one type of animal my dad uh, liked to raise for fun. Exotic chickens. Okay, exotic, you got very excited. <laughs> we're gonna talk exotic chickens after show. Okay, all right. Uh, exotic chickens are chickens that have feathers coming out of the top of their head, or they might have feathers coming off of their feet, or they might have a side of Caribbean jerk sauce. <laughs> but he had these exotic chickens, and um, he would call them his wandering flowers. And my little sister would call them her childhood trauma. <laughs> as you see, one time she wanted to pet the chicken, and the chicken took this as an act of aggression and brutally attacked her. And ironically, she now works for the Humane Society. But um, So what my dad did was he decided the chicken's too aggressive, moves too quickly, we're going to put little shackles on its feet. So you know how a chicken normally have these big dramatic steps? Like, well, the chicken continued to walk with drama and purpose, but it could only take little steps, like... And after a while, um, oh, and by the way, PETA feels a certain type of way about my dad now. <laughs> well, after a while, the chicken got older and less aggressive, and so my dad took the sh shackles off the chicken's foot, feet. Um, but the weird thing was, the chicken continued to walk like... And you know, guys, I think, I think we can learn something from that. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but it really sounds like a sermon illustration, doesn't it? <laughs> so um, I, I have a Nebraska accent that confuses people down here. I had one person ask me, are you Swedish? <laughs> and frankly, that's a much better story. So I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Her <da -der. laughs> Um, I had uh, people get confused about my age as well. I had a young man at work ask me how old I was. So I told him to guess because I enjoy making young men feel uncomfortable. <laughs> and he said 39. And actually at the time I was 41. So I was really offended. <laughs> and I said, don't you know that when you guess a woman's age, you're supposed to shave five years off your real guess to be polite. And he said, I did. <laughs> I thought maybe he was going to hit on me. He was not doing a good job. I don't get hit on very much. Um, I think it's because I have a RMF, a resting mom face. See, that's when men look at you and are like, ooh, we better be polite. She might have cookies. I've been going gray since I was 17, and I've just recently started letting it grow out. And uh, in an unrelated note, I've started lying about my age. I tell everybody I'm 65. They're like, wow, what's your secret? And I'm like, well, I'm lying.
Well, Memphis is wonderful. You guys are so good at acting polite. Another thing you're really good at is scaring people out of wanting to live in Memphis. <laughs> like when we moved here, I was calling some apartment complexes. I got this one woman on the phone. She was like, this is kind of a dangerous neighborhood. You might not want to live here. And I was like, wow, you are bad at your job. <laughs> But later I learned you might not want to live here is actually the city motto, so. <laughs> I remember driving into town the first time and I saw your billboard that said, real men don't murder. In Nebraska, we say real men don't use porn. I guess the standards drop along with the latitude. My husband hasn't quite grasped um, that this is a less safe place to live. We live at uh, the, around uh, 240 and Perkins. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a Kroger street, but it's an Aldi neighborhood. <laughs> and one night my husband's like, I think I'm going to go out for a job after dark. And I was like, sweetie, there have been eight murders in the last year within a mile of our house. How many murders will it take for you to decide this is a bad idea? Because I can guarantee, if you go jogging, I will personally make sure there are nine. <laughs> he didn't like that. I was once telling a woman about uh, where I live, and she said, you need to move. Whoa. I was like, um, well, yeah, we're poor. <laughs> What you can do. And she's like, if you can't afford to live in a decent neighborhood, you can't afford to live in Memphis. And I was like, well, don't tell me you've never worked at Amazon without telling me you've never worked at Amazon. <laughs> I didn't actually say that. I thought it six months later in the shower. I was like, that's what I should have said. Now, what I actually said was, well, my husband is at the university getting a degree. And she said, well, there are better ways of getting ahead in life than going to college. He could join the military. <laughs> so you're saying it's better to volunteer to get shot at <laughs> than to live in my neighborhood. Okay. Okay. But uh, there's some really neat things I've noticed about Memphis, like... Um, I, I, you guys have different lingo. I, I learned, I, I never before I moved to Memphis had I heard anybody say, feel in a certain type of way. I know, this is crazy. Um, and so what I did when I first heard it was, of course, I went to Google it and uh, learned what it meant and immediately started using it wrongly. See, Google says the first definition of feel in a certain type of way is um, aroused. So I called my husband, I said, uh, I'm on my way home and I just want you to know that I'm feeling a certain type of way. He said, oh babe, me too, I think it was the wings. <laughs> and then I talked to my neighbor and I was like, can you recommend a church? And she said, well, I only really go to church when I'm feeling a certain type of way. <laughs> So that's why religion is so big in the South. <laughs> Another thing I thought was in unusual is I saw a restaurant sign that said, catfish, gyros, Chinese. And I thought, wow, it takes a special kind of confidence to believe you can do all those things well. You know, like that's like if I went to a gynecologist slash veterinarian. <laughs> I was skeptical, but you all do all those things well. It's crazy. My favorite Chinese place is Yum's Subs. And my favorite burger is at Mr. Wu's food truck. <laughs> it's amazing. Then I learned something new. I went to the zoo with my kids the other weekend. At your zoo, right by the name of each animal, it has their astrological sign. Which I'm like, okay, like if, I, if I'm a zookeeper, can I call and be like, hey, look, I am not going in to feed the tigers today. Mercury is in retrograde. <laughs> and then the boss is like, oh, but you're supposed to meet a handsome stranger today. And I'm like, oh, what, like a surgeon? <laughs> so that's, uh, 
that's interesting things about Memphis. I love Memphis. I love Memphis. Um, I, we, my whole family moved here. I've got two kids. I got Eleanor. She is the youngest, and she is eight. And she is this brilliant ball of sunshine, which is why I prefer my son. <laughs> she loves to draw. She will draw, like, she'll make, like, ten drawings in a day. She's either going to be an artist or, like, a very efficient factory worker. And recently she got invited to her first slumber party. My husband and I were talking about whether she should go and I said to my husband, if we don't let her go to slumber parties, how is she gonna learn that little girls are terrible? I remember my first slumber party. I had this friend Tori. And Tori was that kind of friend that you have that every few weeks or so you're like, why am I friends with this person? This was in third grade, I remember one time she, uh, she stuck her thumb in my face and said, smell my thumb, it smells like roses. Yeah, it smelled like genitals. <laughs> yeah, she was that kid, you can see why. Uh, so I was at her face, or I was at her place for a slumber party, and it's dark, it's like three in the morning, and we're all telling scary stories, and Tori decides to tell us a story about a serial killer that would kill his victims, uh, his female victims, by s cutting off uh, their breasts. And later I wondered if there was any way the boob whacker was real. <laughs> and I looked it up, and there, this is sad fact, there was a group in the early 80s called the Ripping Crew that would kill wom women in this way. And I also learned that if you Google boob whacker, that's not the first thing that comes up. <laughs> So Tori is telling us about the serial killer. And we're scared, it's raining, it's lightning, we're shrieking a little bit, and then suddenly we start hearing steps come up the stairs. And the doorknob turns. And it's Tori's mom. Oh. Tori's mom's like, what, what are you guys making so much noise for? And so Tori told her all about the boob whacker. And then Tori's mom, made the most baller parenting statement I have ever heard. I, I just hope that someday I can be this kind of mom. She said, girls, if the boob whacker were here, do you really think he'd mess with you? <laughs> I also have an 11 year old son named Severin. Severin was so much fun growing up. He's such a character. I grew up with uh, no brothers, and so I was potty training a boy. And I, I get down, I sit him down on the toilet, and I sit myself down, and I realize I am directly in the line of fire. <laughs> and uh, so we dealt with that. And then when he went to preschool, I said, all right, sweetie, uh, when you go to preschool, you're going to have to push your own penis down. Uh, the teacher's not going to do that for you. He said, oh, why not? I said, well, because the cops would come. He was like, oh, oh, and the cops will push down my penis. <laughs> no, sweetie, we don't pay them enough for that. And mommy doesn't want her taxes to go up. Another time we're riding in the car and he says to me out of the blue, mommy, my penis is scared. I was like, uh, what, what do you mean? My penis is scared. When we go over bumps, it gets scared. And I said, tell your penis not to worry. And he said, Mom, I don't speak penis. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know what to tell you, kid. I don't speak penis ear, either. I've been telling your dad that for years. <laughs> I remember uh, when he... Uh, went to preschool, he, he started to become a little more unruly as time went on. And uh, his teachers would try to wrap this up in a, a kind fashion by saying, you know, the thing is, he's strong-willed, but the good news is he won't give in to peer pressure when he's older. But I was like, okay, but what if his peers are like the good kids? Like, what if his peers are like, hey, Severin, let's go study at the library. And my kid's like, nah, let's kidnap a chihuahua. <laughs> and paint it purple. And then snort cocaine off its back. 
Anyway, that's my parenting advice for you guys tonight. Let's bring Richard Reck up here. Thank you so much. <laughs> 